Welcome to the Bonhoeffer Show with Bill Hall. The show about stuff most people try to avoid, but can't because it controls their lives, religion, culture, and politics. Why does Bill Hall host this show? Because he and Bonhoeffer hoisted a few brews together in Berlin. Ah, uh, nope, that never happened. Is it that Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, both challenged and changed Bill as a young man? Well, yes, that is part of it. But it's primarily because Bonhoeffer called us to a costly discipleship. And there has never been a time when such courage has been more absent or desperately needed than now. Bonhoeffer famously said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. The Bonhoeffer Project is committed to turning leaders into disciple makers. Because if leaders fail to create disciple making movements, then we have failed. So, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. He's still tall and good looking. And yes, he is wearing German cologne. He's acquired a few more underlying conditions. But direct from his underground bunker in Long Beach, California, the man who once told Don Henley, you can check out any time you want, but you can never leave, Bill Hall. Hello, it's uh, season two, it's show number six. Calling Out the Idols, Part 2. This is Bill Hull, and this is the Bonhoeffer Show. So we're so glad that you uh, have chosen to download and to be with us today. And I just wanted to start off by uh, reviewing where we are. We are talking about how do we establish a missionary encounter with our culture. And first, there's confrontation, which leads to conflict. But then the second point is you get converts. You begin to develop and you begin to train those converts, teaching them to obey that everything that Christ has commanded. And then the third thing is that we have to call out the idols. The first idol that we called out in the last program was the idol of that God does not exist, that, re that really enlightenment is about reason. It's not about revelation. It's about common sense. It's about science. It's about knowledge that we can know in a test tube, so to speak. And so this was uh, where we talked about God's wrath, God's anger against those who would suppress the truth about him, which is a different kind of knowledge. It's verifiable, obviously. When you look up into the sky and you see a blue sky, when you see a beautiful mountain range, when you see the, the birth of a child, you know something is miraculous. You know something is grand. You know something is greater than humans can really reason out. And that was, that's the point. Now, we come to the uh, calling out of the idols point two. And here's the, what I want to start with. A, you know, one of the, This last year, I reread 1984 by George Orwell, a remarkable writer. I mean, this book is is just be, should be read because of the, how wonderfully it's written. And he wrote it on the Isle of Man when he was dying of lung cancer. At times he had blood running from his nostrils, but he had to get this book done. And there's a scene in the book where they talk about how they had their version of torture and Big Brother would make sure that people would be tortured and to believing and accepting things that they knew weren't real, but they accepted them because it was too painful not to just comply. And here was the process of thought. First, you must say, black is white. Okay, so we all know that black and white on a piece of paper, you got a black piece of paper and you have a white piece of paper, you know that black and white are different. We know that. But first you must say black is white. Then you must believe black is white. Then you come to know like a deep knowledge that black is white. 
And finally, you deny there was ever a difference between black and white. Once a society denies what is obviously true, it slips and falls. They become victims of their own foolishness. This is the point that Paul is making in Romans chapter 1. Such was the dystopia, dystopia experienced by the 1984's main character, Winston Smith. He lived in a world made of lies, but he rebelled because reality has its own voice. It really does. And, and life is filled with this, things like this. Uh, you can believe one thing, but yet reality teaches you quite another. So when we are hoping for a utopia, first you hear only the whispers of reality after many disappointments. That same voice speaks clearly and finally in your own agony. It shouts at the top of its lungs. We would call it a reality's revenge. It's a process. It seems gradual and slow, but it, it gains momentum. You notice the change, and suddenly it's an avalanche. The idol of skepticism, agnosticism, atheism, exemplified in the myth of religious evolution and moral progress led to the denial of what was obvious and they chose to worship other humans, avatars, and creation itself. They rejected revelation. This is Paul's argument. They reasoned without revelation, which always leads to foolishness. So what God did was what is the following. In 124 of Romans, here's what God did when people insisted on believing things that, that were obviously untrue, but they had convinced themselves were true. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. You know, a lot of people want to be their own God because they want to do whatever they want to do. And I think probably everybody listening to this podcast knows someone like that has a family member who is like that, who can find a, an example in every strata of society like that, and most importantly, that we can all find it in ourselves. We all know that we're guilty of this very thing ourselves. And that's what I want to talk about today, so let's take a break and listen to Steve Simmons a bit about how you can get involved in the Bonhoeffer Project. Do it. We turn leaders into disciple makers. That's the mission of the Bonhoeffer Project. But before we can turn you into a disciple making leader, we need you to be in a cohort. A cohort is a one year, 10 meeting, book reading, praying, wrestling, writing, planning challenge that has the potential to change you and thus redirect your life. Interested? Here's the process. Go to our website, thebonhoefferproject.com, and complete the application form. We will contact you. We will then help you select the type of cohort that's best for you. In person, online, or online school, which is asynchronous, so it's not affected by time zones and anyone in the world can access it. Oh, and training is now also available in Spanish. In the meantime, Subscribe to the show, read one of Bill's books, and send us a question you want Bill or some member of the Bonhoeffer team to answer. And now, back to the show. Thank you, Steve. Uh, in large part, this, the antecedent of this, is that people, God abandoned them to do the shameful things their hearts desired has already happened with a simple majority of Americans. God has not forsaken us. He has, however, given us our head and said, okay, have it your way. Have it your way. Our society has agreed to live for desire rather than obedience to his laws and principles. It's often said, follow your heart. Follow your heart. This is terrible advice, actually, for people to follow their heart because ancient biblical concepts Jeremiah, who lived 500 years before Christ, who was the weeping prophet, who was the most, you know, if you said, who is the most person who had the best illustrations, it was Jeremiah. He had the pot, and he had the hammer, and he had all these different tools, and he had these different illustrations. The human heart in 17, 9, and 10 of 
Jeremiah. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. So why would you follow it? Why would you trust it? And desperately wicked. Oh, my. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all things, all hearts, and examine secret motives. So if you want to know what is in a person, only God really knows. I give all people their due rewards or according to what their actions deserve. Now, that's pretty bad news, isn't it? Yeah, we all know our own hearts. Well, let's put it this way. We all know a little bit about our own hearts, what will grant permission for ourselves to know about ourselves. But God puts good desires in us. That is confirmed by Paul's description in his letter to the Philippians. God is working in you, he says, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Philippians 2.13. But when, the, but when uh, left to our own devices, when we have decided not to listen to God, he lifts his hand from our shoulder, and the decline begins. The idol of human desire is the abyss of decadence that is degrading to the soul. As a result, it goes on to say in Romans chapter 1, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Okay, well, this gets into uh, what we might say <clears throat> is territory that uh, makes us all uncomfortable, but we must go there anyway. This could be called the sexual revolution. In George Orwell's 1984, the Ministry of Truth Building was an enormous pyramidal structure of glittering white concrete soaring up terrace after terrace, 300 meters into the air. There were three slogans of the party. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. And you say, what? <laughs> and I wouldn't blame you. You want to grab your head between your hands and shake it and ask yourself, you know, this is, isn't this nonsense? It's upside down and backwards. Have they lost their minds? Everyone knew it was nonsense until they didn't. When you see a riot on television and the commentator tells you it's peaceful and it isn't, you shout, what? Um... But if you hear it enough, if you see it enough, finally you say, well, maybe there's some truth in that. That is how revolutions begin, and that is how Lucifer changed society's mind about sexual behavior. You know, I didn't go to Woodstock, gratefully, uh, but my generation, the 1960s, was tumultuous. It was uh, a decade of sexual permissiveness, uh, free love, I don't know, uh, I didn't get any of that free love, but I, I heard a lot about it. Unabated public nudity, increased violence in movies, the popularity of LSD, uh, Aldous Huxley, and The Doors of Perception, the famous book, and then uh, Jim Morrison and The Doors, the, the music group, the, you know, the, the, the door was to The Doors of Perception. Uh, and it was talk, it was really about the drug culture and about... Uh, thinking differently, uh, talking about thinking not only out of the box, but thinking out of your mind. Uh, traditional morality was being challenged in music and literature, rebellion was in the air, protests on the college campuses, and marches in the streets were normative. This was everything from violent students for the democratic society, the Black Panthers, uh, the student rebellions, to and Everything from Martin Luther King to the Civil Rights Movement, school desegregation, busing, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, and the 60s closed with the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. So I said, shocking, uh, tumultuous, violent. It was a lot of change, a lot of churning going on in the culture. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. 
There were riots in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention, and Richard Nixon was elected president. The Vietnam War was in full swing. It was unpopular in the 60s, spilled over into the early 70s with the Watergate scandal and the resignation of uh, President Nixon. Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, city desk writers at the Washington Post, broke the Watergate case wide open. They became national heroes, won the Pulitzer Prize, and it's popular to say America lost its innocence. I think theologically we'd say we lost our innocence a long time before that. But anyway, that, that's kind of what happened in the 1960s. And this was, and part of all this was the sexual revolution. A lot of the convention, conventional truth and customs and practices and what was forbidden and not forbidden uh, changed. And for my perch as a high school student, then a college student, and then as a newly married young man, I was a bystander in all this. I became a Christian in 1967 in a small Christian university, and then joined an evangelical student organization. I was playing basketball. The sexual revolution happened all around me, but not to me. The church was clearly a bystander and was not penetrated in any noticeable way in the 1960s through the middle of the 1970s. I mean, we it was a kind of an island of safety and of uh, a kind of a monolith of morality and understanding and worldview. But about this time, I was given a Bible with a cover that proclaimed revolution now. Our goal was to fulfill the Great Commission by 1976 in the United States and by 1980 in the world. We went about this mission with all our beings and with complete sincerity. It was fair to say that much good was done, great numbers heard in the bridge gospel, millions worldwide prayed the sinner's prayer. You know, really only God knows what really happened. If the Great Commission was fulfilled, the result didn't lead to include societal change or a culture of higher moral values. It really didn't. Because society has become more morally confused. But that's because the ruling class of our country became the people with the levers of power, they were not swept up into this. Uh, it was more of the middle class. Truth as a serious category had collapsed because in the academy, what was becoming obvious was people who were considered loonies and liberals, uh, crazy liberals and you know, loony left and all those kinds of people who were uh, insurrectionist in the uh, classroom at major universities in the country were considered loony at that time. Now they're considered, you know, they're the chairman of the departments. Now they're considered seasoned veterans. They've, they've become normal. It's become normative. Truth is a serious category is collect. The only pe place people want the truth, it seems like, is when they walk into their bank. A society built on desire is like a house built on the sand. So, it's become like Isaiah's lament. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter, Isaiah 5.20. So those of you who are current on your Karl Marx, you might recall the term false consciousness. It goes something like this. You may think you're happy in your home with your little family, singing in the shower, having dinner every night at 6.30, uh, mowing the grass, just having a great time, but actually you're not happy. You're really not. Someone has just taught you that you're happy. Actually, you're unhappy. Your life should be better. It's a false consciousness. It's a form of mental illness. You may think only women can have babies, but hey, that's just a social construct. Men who pretend to be women can best beat actual women in a foot race, boxing, or arm wrestling. Yeah, and it's even fair. The glorious thing is it's all fair, and people don't think these confused men are cheating. It's also glorious. The welfare state is not a trillion-dollar con. It's uh, worked, and we need more of it. If you appease rioters, don't arrest them. Let them go. Uh, when you exercise your constitutional right as a woman to terminate a pregnancy, that goblet of flesh inside of you is not a helpless, innocent human being. 
It's a potential life that would have hindered or threatened your freedom. Don't worry, it's not a person who would have called you mommy, who brought you great joy to your life, grabbed you around your neck and said, I love you, mommy, I love you. It wasn't a loving son or daughter that would have taken care of you in your old age and given you grandchildren. No, that's just false consciousness. So we are at this stage in American society where many leaders in politics and media are asking us to deny reality. And of course, this is of great concern. And uh, we'll get back to that in just a moment, but let's take another break. And in, during this break, uh, you'll hear about how you can subscribe, how you can become part of a cohort, because we turn leaders into disciple makers, and we can't do that unless you get in a cohort. So here's how you get in a cohort, and here's some of the cohorts that are coming up. If you want to expand the disciple making movement, then share the show with your friends and colleagues. Hey, it's easy to subscribe. Simply go to iTunes or to our website, thebonhoefferproject.com, then click on The Bonhoeffer Show. Once you do, we will keep you updated with The Bonhoeffer Project's events, new materials and books, as well as the larger disciple-making movement current news. You can also access previous programs. And be sure to read Bill's weekly column, which is posted on the website. Remember, ask questions. Bill's answers are guaranteed to give you herd immunity, increase your IQ, and cause you to experience waves of euphoria. Well, not really, but his answers are really good. And now, let's get back to the Bonhoeffer Show. Well, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, now, we've come to that part of the program where I want to do something different. And uh, I heard a story recently uh, by Dr. Um, Winston, who was at MIT for many years. Uh, he was an expert in artificial intelligence. And uh, on YouTube, you can look at this. It's called How to Give a Speech or How to Give a Talk. And it's actually a brilliant presentation. And I really have, there's a lot to admire about this man. He passed away about a year or two years ago two years ago. But he said, uh, he told a story that I want to tell you, and then I want to show you something on screen that I'm sharing with you right now. I hope, well, I'm not actually sharing it yet. Hold on a second. Um, what I want to do is uh, I'll tell you the story while we uh, share here. Okay. And uh, what... Uh, what uh, the doctor said was that he, you know, was presented uh, with a prize, and uh, this prize uh, meant that he was able to go to, I believe it was New York City, to the Museum of Natural, uh, actually Metropolitan Museum of History. And uh, he sat next at this dinner, uh, at the United Nations dinner, uh, with uh, Julia Child, the great uh, and famous chef and uh, a person who was on television for many years, I remember. Uh, there was a movie about her named Julia and Julia uh, not long ago. It was about actually two people named Julia. And uh, so uh, anyway, uh, during the dinner, uh, people kept coming up to Julia Child and they wouldn't really give her any peace and she hadn't had a chance to eat. Uh, she was signing autographs, taking pictures. And finally, the uh, professor turned to her and said, do you like being famous? She says, well, you get used to it, but it's better than being ignored. And then he started talking about if you want, you, if you want not to be ignored in life, that you need certain things about your story, about your life. And I thought the Bonhoeffer uh, project needs its star. It needs a, a story. And so... Uh, I'm gonna share my star with you as far as the Bonhoeffer Project, and here's what I thought you might do. This might help you in uh, fundraising, it might help you as a pastor or leader in your ministry. If you can do this, if you can uh, make 
your story and your life and your the project you're working on as clear as this, I think it might really be helpful to you. So here we go. Let's hope it works, okay? The first thing is uh, that in the star, the first thing you need is a symbol. And of course, for the Bonhoeffer project, that symbol are the glasses, the, the red circle with the white rimmed glasses because Bonhoeffer was, that's our logo, that's our symbol. Uh, that's what distinguished Bonhoeffer in some, some ways because that's the look of Bonhoeffer. But once you have the star, then you need, um, and the next thing, and this is where, ladies and gentlemen, you have to be patient with me because I may not be able to pull this off. Okay, let me do it this way. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. You need a slogan. Okay, then the slogan is, and I'm going to move this over just so I can see it all. Um, the slogan is, we turn leaders into disciple makers. So that's our slogan. So everybody needs a slogan of what it is, you know, what is it you do in one statement? We turn leaders into disciple makers. Then the next thing you need is a surprise. In other words, the aha moment. And the aha moment in the Bonhoeffer project is where you say, I'm wrong, I've been wrong, or I've been, uh, maybe I'm not wrong uh, as much as I've just not been as comprehensive or I've not been as clear about what my gospel is and about the fact that I have not been making the, the centerpiece of my life as a leader, as a disciple maker. Uh, maybe I've done something else. Maybe I've chosen other kinds of fields, other kinds of emphasis. Uh, also, I maybe have been teaching a gospel that has not included disciple-making as a natural part of what it means to be saved. Maybe I've been teaching a forgiveness-only gospel, or a prosperity gospel, or a gospel of the left, or a gospel of the right, or a consumer gospel, uh, instead of the, the gospel of the kingdom, uh, the discipleship gospel, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. So a symbol, a slogan, a surprise. Now, the next one is you need a salient, salient idea. Now, salient is one of those words that we use, and we have to look up in the dictionary to make sure we know what it means. But it means that it jumps off the page. It means that uh, salient means it begins to sail. You know, the, 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 ver the etymology of the word has to do with picking something up and moving it forward. And, and so salient has this idea, that, and, and here's a salient idea, and it comes through generation after generation after generation of people that have been involved in the Bonhoeffer Project, and that is the gospel you believe in determines the disciple you make. In other words, if you have a gospel that is consumer gospel, there's no way you can become a, a Christ-like disciple, and I'll tell you why. Because the consumer gospel is about me, and the gospel that Jesus taught is about others. That's why. So you, they're diametrically opposed, actually. And then finally, you, you need a story. And our story is about, of course, how most conversations begin at midstream, which is make disciples, and then everybody wants to go from the command to make disciples down to the next thing downstream, which is the plan, the how-to, the materials, uh, the nuts and bolts, which are really important, but that, that's not where you begin. You know, there's a box above the box, and that box above the box is the gospel, and that the gospel you believe in determines the disciple you make, and so what a disciple is then goes down to the plan, and it all needs to be in alignment. And what we've done, the problem that we've created, is that we've taken salvation, and as the box shows, we've divided it into conversion and discipleship. And that's what the really essence of my book, Conversion and Discipleship, You Can't Have One Without the Other, is about. And so that's a theological problem. And that's what we wrestle with in the Bonhoeffer Project. And so we do all three. We do upstream, midstream, downstream. We do uh, the gospel. We do the definition and of the disciple, and then how we make them, and then finally we get into the plan, how it's executed. Well, that's it for today, and as we always like to say, 
Follow Jesus and he'll teach you everything you'll ever need to know. Well, we hope that the show wasn't too bad. Jane Hull wants everyone to know that if anything Bill said was offensive, (laughs) she feels your pain. If you were upset by anything Bill and his guests said, well, (laughs) mission accomplished. At the Bonhoeffer Show, we value irreverent, satirical, and generally inappropriate behavior. But when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission, we don't mess around. Remember, subscribe. We promise. No private jets, no white suits, and definitely no toupees.